my life is a miracle. Every child has a story of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story. Hi, I'm Veronica Statch. Welcome to Shalom World's original program, Jesus My Savior, where we give you moving conversion journeys from all over the world. Our guest today had a childhood fascination with God's creation, which put her en route to becoming a scientist with a doctorate in chemistry. But science veered her towards atheism. Today, we dive deeper into her conversion story. Let us welcome theologian, writer, and executive director at St. Philip's Institute in Tyler, Texas, Dr. Stacey Trisankos. Hi, I'm Stacy Trasankos, Executive Director of Bishop Joseph Strickland's St. Philip Institute in the Diocese of Tyler. I'm a wife to my husband, Jose, a mother of seven children and a grandmother of six. I became Catholic really because chemistry led me to Christ. Um, what I mean by that is that I abandoned my childhood Baptist religion to study science in college. Um, I became enamored with chemistry because it's all about the fundamental um, structure underlying our macroscopic experience, and it was a search for truth. But I, I truly lived the lifestyle for decades where I thought science, I was convinced science had all the answers. And I know firsthand the dangers of trying to grapple, the futility of trying to grapple with morality when you think everything is atoms and molecules. Uh, so I want to share my conversion story and how chemistry did lead me to Christ. Um, and to, to say to people that um, you know, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior now because um, of Adams, but because in searching for truth in science and then being led to look beyond science to the greater truth of who the Creator is and why are we here um, and, and coming to understand that we are body and soul made in the image and likeness of God to think and make good choices and pursue virtue and get ourselves to heaven and use every day except the grace from God to lead others that he puts in our path to heaven too. Why uh, my love for science led me to a fuller truth and, and a greater understanding of all of reality. Hi, Stacey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. You grew up as a Baptist, but at some point uh, you fell away from those roots. Did you push away uh, the notion of God altogether? And if you did, how and why did that happen? I remember being just a little child believing in God, just like I believed in my parents. I, I don't remember ever struggling with that because it was just a simple um, God made everything. When I got older, I had a lot of questions and I, I, I'm saying what happens to so many kids, but I, I had a lot of questions. I was a truth seeker. I loved science. I wanted to understand how things worked. And um, and I just didn't find a lot of questions. I remember distinctly being very confused in the Bible Belt down here when I heard um, the Church of Christ people say they were the only ones going to heaven. And the Methodist friends I had said they heard at their church that they were the only ones going to heaven. And, uh, and I asked my Baptist Sunday school teacher about it, and um, she said they were wrong. And so I, I didn't know who to believe. Um, it, it was it was very confusing. I just concluded that there were so many things that didn't make sense or hang together or have deep answers that maybe going to church on Sunday was just like being part of a club and fellowship. It was just something nice um, and that believing in God was just something people did that wanted to be in that club. So I, I just, when I got to college and I started studying biology, 
I just, it was just the most reasonable thing in the world for me to say, well, science has all these answers. I want to pursue that. That seemed like the grown up thing to do. And, um, and my Baptist faith just kind of went the way of Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. You know, it, it, it sufficed when I was little, but I was going to be a more sophisticated, mature, grown up person. I didn't want to live that simple life. Um, that I perceived wrongly at the time that people around me were living. So I, I kind of arrogantly decided that science had all the answers and I wasn't going to go to church anymore. Um, so you say that you felt like science had all the answers. Did you ever encounter uh, a question or a moment where you were stumped and you realized maybe science doesn't have all the answers? After I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I taught high school for two years, and then I um, left to go to Penn State to work in the research laboratory of, of, of the professor I judged to be the, the most prominent, most advanced um, professor studying artificial photosynthesis, an alternative energy source. So I, I went off to Pennsylvania to study with him and to put as many miles between me and Texas as I could. Um, because I wanted to get away from it. And it was there in those labs studying artificial photosynthesis, being told that an alternative energy source, that if we could develop it in our labs or contribute new knowledge to help develop a new energy, an alternative energy source to fossil fuels, that I would be helping to save the world in some way. And that was, that was a great calling. I wanted to do something good. But simulating photosynthesis on nanocomposite materials in a state-of-the-art chemistry lab is, a, it's an absurd undertaking. Um, and it wasn't lost on me one day when my research wasn't going so well that I looked out my window from the third floor laboratory where I, where I was and, and I just looked at a tree. <laughs> And I remember looking at that tree and it was a ginkgo biloba tree. It was very tall, very old, beautiful. And it and it was like the veil fell away in that moment. It was like I was looking at that tree and I was thinking about all that happens on how every um, square millimeter of every leaf, there is half a million or so little five micron long chloro. Um, chloroplast organelles with uh, with all this nano machinery inside that takes visible light from the sun and converts it into energy that makes these three carbon precursors that go on from the tree and get eaten in, into the life cycle and and pretty much make all the biomass on earth. And I, I was thinking about how that is that sun, water, and our breath makes all the biomass on earth and it's this incredibly complex fine-tuned well orchestrated nanofactory of get little molecules and blobs of proteins just so far apart um, in the right um, position according to each other the right fluid in this place the right matrix in this place how it all fit together with these click 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 chemical reactions happening just so every like more than you could even write down in every second that happens that's creating all the biomass and i and i in that moment i remember thinking there there is a really great chemist out there who made all of this universe and it's funny that i'm in here in this lab trying to save the planet and out there is the whole universe and i'm I'm not even willing to face up to the fact that everything I'm trying to do as a scientist is mimicking and simulating nature. And so in that moment, I was like seeing God. Wow. So that was almost like a seed that was planted. There's just the beginning. Uh, but you had said in your other testimonies that you were living around this time kind of almost as though you didn't have a moral compass. Um, what did that look like? Materialism isn't just a philosophical concept. It's a very, very dangerous way to live your life. And the, the end logic of assuming that everything is atoms and molecules, everything's physical or material, is that the human person is just atoms and molecules and that other people you encounter 
are just biological organisms doing their thing, you know, doing whatever the atoms are supposed to be doing as they bond with each other and change and react. And like, it's all just predetermined. Um, it, it, it robs you of acknowledging the existence of your rational soul. It, it forces you to put, to shut that down. And that is where we find our moral compass. That's where we practice virtue with our, with our free will and our intellect being made in the image and likeness of the triune God. So if, if you shut that down and you don't acknowledge it, which is what the rich tradition of the Catholic Church, the intellectual tradition of the Catholic Church talk, teaches us from, you know, God revealed these things. And then we figured out um, all the doctrine that came from that so that we would know how to live our lives and be fully human. If you're shutting that down, you literally don't know how to have relationships. You don't know how to have a, a healthy relationship with another person. And by the time I figured that out, I was a single mother of two children. Um, and I knew they needed a moral code. I just didn't have any clue where to start with that. Um, I knew I didn't have a moral code. There was a whole lot of wreckage I had created in my life and my wake because I, I just didn't know how to care about another person. I, I didn't know how to treat them the right way. I didn't know how to sustain a relationship when things got scary or I got too vulnerable. I just ended it. So it, it wreaked havoc on my life and it literally brought me to my knees. I remember kneeling down one night when I was so lonely, so just, I had broken all my relationships. I didn't know what I was, I didn't know how to love my kids the right way, that I didn't know how to be the mother they needed me to be. And I just made a mess of everything. And I just remember getting on my knees in my bedroom one night and, and it was like, God, give me another chance. Like just can you just take all this away and let me just have a do over and I'll, I'll, I'll try to figure this out this time. I'll, I don't, I don't even know where I'm going, but I, I, I get it. You're there and um, I'll be all in. And, and I, I, I'm serious. A few months later, I just passed my husband, my now husband in the hallway at a conference and he, the sun was shining on me and I remember exactly what I was wearing and he walked by me and he just smiled at me and looked me straight in the eyes and said, good morning. And we talked and we got married and we had, I asked him, where's the rest of the truth? And he led me into the Catholic church and, and now we have seven kids and six grandchildren. <laughs> so Stacy, it sounds almost like Jesus had to really knock at the door of your heart a few times before you were ready to sort of take that leap that, that yes, uh, sort of like Mama Mary did when she gave her fiat. Um, what do you think was that main obstacle or that main thing that really kept you from taking the leap before, that kept you putting on those breaks in the past? I was very scared. Um, and I, you know, I, I say this for people who try to talk to atheists or who have loved ones who are turning away from God. Um, I was scared, but I was I was so scared that I couldn't even admit it to myself. Like I, I just couldn't go there. Um, you you get comfortable in daily life, just going to the grocery store, worrying about what you're going to wear, worrying about whether you should do the dishes. Um, you know, when I had my kids were little, then you know, getting them to daycare and all the things I was doing, just moving through the motions of life. And you go to bed, and you go to sleep, and you get up, and you do it again. And you don't have to think about those bigger questions. Like you literally don't have to think about them. And 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 anytime, just like staring at that tree that day, anytime I would start to think about the bigger questions, I would just shut it down. And it, and I'm sure now looking back, it was fear. I just didn't want to think there. I didn't want to think about why did I hurt this other person so bad? Um, I didn't want to face up to it. I didn't, I just, you know, it doesn't matter. Like if you don't, if you don't believe in the soul, you don't believe in God, it doesn't really even matter if you hurt somebody else in your in your in your logic, of course, in your heart, because even though you're not even though you're not paying attention to your rational soul and your heart and your mind, you're, you still are a child of God and God still made you in his image and likeness. And you still have that longing to love and be loved and to want to be known and to want to know other people, to be in communion and to belong in your families and your community. And, and so I still had those feelings, but it scared me because I, not only did I know how to think about God, I did, I mean, God to me was just this, this country club 
group that you want to be in when you're young because you want to have fellowship and yellow casseroles when you go to potluck dinners or whatever. It just didn't. I didn't know how to think about God and I didn't know how to think about the bigger questions. And I just remember I kept shutting it down. And I think that's so easy for all of us to do that. We go to mass, um, even especially now as the churches are reopening and people aren't coming back to mass. I think we just don't think about the bigger questions. We don't think about the fact that there are angels in the room with us right now, that the Lord of the universe, the literally the Lord who made the whole universe and holds it in existence is right there with us whenever we go to mass. And and so for for me, it just I just kept I just kept not wanting to do the hard work of thinking bigger. And and I think it was scary too when I when I did think maybe I needed to do the hard work and ask the bigger questions because I realized my life wasn't working. Then I was afraid. And and then when I realized facing up to God would mean facing up to my sins. You know, if God knows every hair on your head, then to a chemist, God knows where every electron is, something that eludes chemists. God knows where every electron is and every atom and every carrot and protein molecule on every hair of your head. So it's like a little too much in your face um, to acknowledge that there is this being that knows that there is being itself that knows you this much. And then you have to confess your sins. And, you know, it's just it's a lot to get your mind around. And and if I remember thinking, I don't know if I can do it well, like maybe I can face up to it and acknowledge God and God loves me. And and I don't know if I need deserve to be loved. But if I can get my head around all of that, like I, I still don't know if I can face up to all my sins. Like it's hard enough to look in the mirror when you do one thing wrong. It's really hard to face up to a whole lifetime of sin and, and, and say, you're gonna be okay. The thing that got me through absolutely is I knew people who were Catholics and it's like, well, they didn't burst into flames. So I I guess you can be okay if you do this. And that gave me a lot of confidence. I just saw that they were joyful and I thought, well, I want that joy that they have. So what, whatever it requires of me, I, I must be able to do it. And so that's, that's really what caught me past it in the end. It's like, these people I admire can do it, so I can do it too. It could be so intimidating to take that responsibility uh, to face our own truth of our brokenness. Um, mm-hmm. And even to know that if we choose Jesus, choose Catholicism, we may need to change things in our lives, most likely. What would you say was the hardest thing that you really needed to change or detach from if you were going to accept Jesus as your Savior? I, the hardest thing it was to put, to get my head around being a mother. Um, you know, it it was it was scary that I had failed so much. Like by the time I had that moment, my my oldest child was twelve years old, so heading into the teenage years, and um, it it was just scary knowing that I, I didn't really know what to do with her. I, did, I didn't know how to reconnect with her. You know, I, I figured it out, but I just remember it was a very, it was a very hard journey trying, because it was kind of too late for her. Um, and I, I kept wanting to go back to my safe place where I didn't have to face up to all this hard work. And, uh, and it was really hard with her. her she's 31 now. Um, and, uh, she, she, she was broken because of the way she had been raised by a materialist mother who just had a career and and didn't know how to bond with her. She ended up, you know, running away from home early, um, having a baby very young herself. Um, she now has five kids, but she, she got addicted to drugs and, um, and we, and I almost lost her. And I kept praying. It's like, God, I'm it's one thing to to convert yourself and realize you've gotta you gotta do this yourself, but then you have to live with the fact that you hurt your own baby. And so I you know, I kept that really tested my faith. So for many years I just prayed the miraculous metal prayer over and over and over again and and had faith in God. And it took like ten years before she too hit rock bottom, you know, the legacy I left her, she hit rock bottom, but thank the Lord, she knew where to turn when, when it was time. And and now my beautiful oldest baby girl is 31 years old. She's happily married. She and her husband have bought their own house. They bought a new van last week. They have five children 
and uh, and she's just she's doing fantastic. So uh, the world will often say, you know, faith and science cannot go hand in hand. Were there ever moments after you uh, sort of began to practice your faith within the field? Did you ever have moments of doubt in your newfound faith? Like, did science ever sort of creep up and try to contradict your newfound faith at any point? It honestly doesn't. Like, there's things I still don't quite understand, but I, I think I don't think anybody understands it. Um, so. The science never made me doubt again because I, I had to think long and hard, especially when I was writing my book, Particles of Faith. I, I had to think, like, what is it I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say something here. I just can't quite get it out. And it came out as science is the study of the handiwork of God because science is the study of nature. Nature is creation. Creation is God's handiwork. So once I got that straight in my head, I never, ever looked at science as proving that God exists. I mean, it it. it it is all empirical evidence that God, there is a God and a loving God and a rational God. But not, there was nothing, once I got my head around that, nothing in science ever challenged me to question my faith. What it did make me realize is, is that we are so not God, that we, we don't even understand what's going on. We don't even know how many electrons are on the tip of our nose, but God does. <laughs> God, God understand. God knows all that. He's holding it in existence. And it, it really took on like a bigger awe and wonder. So I never had a doubt because of science. Um, but what I do struggle with is if all these all, if all these neurons are in my brain and, and they're firing like a computer and I'm having these thoughts, which are definitely a function of what my brain's doing, exactly how does my rational soul and my neurons, exact, you know, because I know we can't do, we can't be dualist. We can't say there's the body and then there's the soul, and the body is just an animated. That the the body is like um, being driven by the soul. Like there's not like a, a little ghost in the box here. But I don't really understand yeah. how these two things work. I just know if I'm hungry, like about physically hungry, like I am right now because I'm trying to fast. I'm also grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> like I know that the body affects my soul, and I know that if I if I try to override that in in my prayer or something, I can actually make my body calm down. If I get anxious, I can make my body calm down. So I do know they interact. I just don't understand how, and I don't think anybody does. <laughs> Stacy, thank you so much for being a part of our show. It was such an honor to have you today. Thank you. It was lovely. Thanks for having me here and asking those questions. And thank you for joining us today. We ask you to tune in next time on Jesus My Savior here on Shalom World. I'm Veronica, your host. And God bless you. viewers of Shalom TV throughout the world, I want to encourage you not only to support this amazing media apostolate, but to spread the word to others. We all know how the internet and mass media are polluting the world with the poison of pornography and so much other forms of materialism. This is the source of eternal life, the gospel, and Shalom TV is consecrated to spreading the word of Christ. Thank you.